So today, uh, we um, continue looking uh, in 1 Corinthians. We're still in chapter 14, uh, and we're jumping into a, an often debated uh, section of Scripture. Uh, it's not an easy section of Scripture. It's one that if you've ran across it before, you just kind of, uh, sometimes you maybe just pass over it. You go, all right, nothing to see here, and you just move along, or uh, whatever it is, you just kind of, you, maybe you get uncomfortable, maybe you really wrestle with it. Uh, a lot of Christians just try to um, kind of brush it under the, the rug a little bit, pretend like it's not there. Um, but as I've mentioned many times, uh, as we look at this particular scripture, one of Paul's primary goals in writing this letter was to help the church in Corinth become healthy, uh, to become wise, to become Christ-centered, Christ-following, but there was so much disorder in the church, and there was, it was just chaos all throughout the church. And today we're going to be looking at Paul's general goal of having an orderly church life and also church gatherings, but also these couple uh, curious statements that he makes, controversial statements he makes about the role and activity specifically of women during church services, and it is definitely a hot-button topic. And I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit would guide us as a church family into a better understanding of God's Word and His desire for His bride, the church, as we ask Him for the wisdom in how to be a church, the kind of church that He desires us to be. Uh, in every realm, not just in this particular topic, but in every realm, we want to ask the Lord, uh, as we do really every week, that He would lead us and guide us in truth, that He would help us to be the kind of church that he desires us to be. Not the kind of church we desire to be, but the kind of church that he desires us to be. And that's often hard for us to do, but this morning we're gonna jump into this, uh, hopefully just with uh, an openness to, uh, to his wisdom, his word, his ways, uh, and asking him to, to lead us and guide us in this truth. And, and, I'm, and I'm gonna pray that the, God's word would find a home in our hearts this morning. Uh, that it would find uh, a place, fertile ground in our hearts that is softened uh, so that God's Word can grow and continue to sanctify us and change us. Uh, so let's pray before we jump into 1 Corinthians 14 and ask the Lord to, to work in us today. Father in heaven, we are a thankful group of people. This morning, spending time singing, singing these songs, asking as we sang that you would come, Lord Jesus, that you would be near the brokenhearted, that we declare your praises, singing how great you are. And we just uh, think about the, the night last night of just enjoying each other. You are a great God, a great Father who gives us great gifts. And you're a wise Father a trustworthy Father. We know that we can trust your word and your ways, but like our own natural physical children, sometimes we don't understand and we rebel and we insist on our own way, our own wisdom. We know that our parents are good. We know that they've been around longer than us, but yet we still insist on our own way. Uh, we do the same thing with you. You've been around much longer than us, but yet sometimes we still think that our way is better. We feel like as a, as a people, as a society, as a culture, we've outgrown you. We've become more wise than you. We've become a people like uh, Babel, where we want to make our name great. But God, we don't want to be that kind of a church. We don't want to be those kind of families, marriages. We want to trust that your way is good. So help us to not just trust your ways, but to trust you and who you are. So help us, Father, that your spirit would lead us and guide us today in your truth. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for your word and thank you for your Holy Spirit this morning. And to the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and ask all these things. Amen. 
So 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to be starting in verse 26. I'm going to start reading just through 33. We're going to go through more than that, but I want to start there uh, as we just get some context. So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. So what then, brothers? When you come together, speaking as a church gathering, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. If any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others weigh what is said. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. And we will go further, but I want to stop here and just get this important context before we head into the next section. Paul's overwhelming concern that he has for the Corinthians, not just for the Corinthian church, but for all churches, as he's about to state, is that they learn how to behave and act as they should as a church, one that has order, one that has a proper way of doing things. A humble church, humble towards each other, serving one another. But the Corinthians, as we kind of take a quick review of the last, you know, 13 chapters, 14 chapters, they were suing each other, arguing. They couldn't settle arguments between one another. They were permitting gross sin when they should not be. The women were disrespecting their husbands. People were excluding others from the Lord's Supper cutting in line and not waiting for them to show up. Other people were cozying up to the popular or the rich in the church, giving them a better seat and just kind of getting buddy-buddy with them. They were pursuing gifts for selfish gain to make a name for themselves and build their own selves up, their own pursuits. They were carelessly causing others to stumble with what they ate, what they drank, and not really caring if it bothered somebody else. And here, even with gifts, uh, and in the church meetings, they're interrupting one another, talking over each other. I mean, they just weren't acting like Christians at all. They weren't acting at all as if they were submitted to any kind of God in the universe, let alone the God of the Bible. They were doing things in their own way, in their own wisdom, as they saw fit. And it was wreaking havoc on the church and the witness of the church in Corinth to non-believers. And this is what Paul was devastated about as he looked at their behavior and addressed up until now 14 chapters worth of saying, look, here's some things you guys got to get straight. Here's some things that are are not right in this church family right now. The Corinthian church was, was really just a mess. And so here after addressing many issues in previous chapters, he comes to this point now after addressing spiritual gifts and kind of the misuse of those He gives this instruction to have order, to speak one by one, to defer to one another, that it wouldn't be a a free-for-all and just them doing things the way that they would want to do. And so he continues uh, in the end of verse 33 here. As in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but should be in submission, as the law also says. If there's anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. And before our eyes widen and our eyebrows go up and our jaws drop, let's just take a deep breath. (laughs) Because it is important to understand that these verses are sandwiched in between the paragraph I just read as well as the next paragraph. I'll read the next paragraph, then we'll kind of come back and start diving into this. He says in verse 36, Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones that is reached? So, in other words, he's saying, he's kind of, he's being facetious here. 
The Corinthians had their own way of doing church, not just with this issue of, of women speaking, but with all these other issues, the way they're allowing people to speak out of turn and, and, and really going back into the previous chapters, honestly, like as far as just suing people and everything. He's going, uh, was it from you that the word of God came? Did you, did you come up with a new way of doing things? Did God speak to you and said that you can do all this this way now? It, or are you the only ones that it has reached so you have some special insight from God that, that the rest of the churches don't know about? You can kind of do things. Is that what's going on? He's, he's being sarcastic here. If anyone thinks that he's a prophet, if you guys think you've got a new way of doing church and doing life, or if anyone thinks they're spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things that I'm writing to you as an apostle assigned by God, you should acknowledge the things that I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. You can sit here and say, oh, no, this is what the Lord said and this is how we're going to do things and we're going to do things in our way. But you have to understand that God has appointed me to be an apostle to the churches. And if anyone doesn't recognize this, well, guess what? You're not recognized because God has set me as an apostle to help establish the church in, in these regions. And so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. So the question at hand here is, is order in the church and order in the way that we treat one another and the way that we interact with each other, the way that we connect to each other. So again, the goal in mind here is orderly conduct during worship services specifically, but also in this, the broad part of life, Christian life. And his goal here is not just orderly conduct, not just from the women, but from everyone. The women aren't the only one here in this section that are asked to be silent in church. Prophets speaking out of turn need to be quiet. He's saying, look, you gotta be quiet. It's shameful. He, he's, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of putting some words here and, and kind of uh, extrapolating Paul's thoughts here, but he's saying, look, if you're a prophet, you speak out of turn and interrupt someone, that's shameful. It's shameful for you to be like that. Speaking in tongues with no interpreter, you, you need to be quiet if there's no interpreter. So it's not just the women that he's picking on. However, it does seem like, and in a different way, it looks like he's kind of picking on the women as a whole group. And so we need to give special attention to that, but, but just keeping in mind as we back up a bit that he, the women aren't the only ones he said to be quiet during church. Okay, so, but there is a specific thing here that looks like he's picking on them in particular. Paul has in mind those who might be disruptive or disorderly, women or men, doesn't matter, prophets, you know, these different people that are being disorderly in the church. And keep in mind that these verses are not just in the context of these paragraphs that precede verse 35 and 36, but they're also in the context of the whole book of 1 Corinthians. So we have to look at the whole book to understand what Paul is saying here. And not only that, but 1 Corinthians is in the context of the whole Bible. So we have to look at really the, the whole counsel of God to understand what exactly God or what Paul is saying that, that God's order would be in the church. But too often people, and sometimes we kind of get freaked out when we read certain things, we'll kind of cherry pick, particularly Paul's letters, and some of uh, these, ex uh, these kind of seemingly uh, explosive sentences. So allow me to start broad, uh, and then we'll get a little more detailed. You can follow along a little bit in your notes here. The first thing that we can recognize is that the Bible affirms the active participation of women in the activity of discipleship, both privately and in the public. Okay, just a couple examples here. Women are told to teach the younger women in Titus 2. Uh, Eunice was commended for teaching her son Timothy in 2 Timothy. Priscilla and Aquila were a husband and wife duo. Uh, they corrected and taught Apollos in his doctrine in Acts chapter 18. And though those examples are mostly private aspects of discipleship, we also have uh, Hulda. She was a prophetess. In second, in second Chronicles. So we had a prophetess in, in the Old Testament, other women in the Old Testament who spoke publicly the things of God. Peter mentions the Old Testament in his sermon in Acts chapter 2 that lets the church know that women would prophesy. So even in the New Testament, we see the Old Testament being affirmed. Acts chapter 2, verse 17, I'll read it to you. He's quoting the Old Testament it says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, sons and daughters, and your young men, men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And the assumption 
for prophesying, especially in this particular uh, text here, is to build up the church, a publicly shared gift given. But these prophetic words from both men or from women should be weighed, as Paul says and affirms in this text, there should be order about this. These things should be weighed to make sure that they are biblical. And that is one of the points that Paul made in that section. So, so we can see that, that, that Scripture affirms uh, women's role in the church, both private and public, and this discipleship. Secondly, we can know that Paul is not making a blanket forbidding statement for women to ever speak in churches. We know that he's not doing this, though it seems like that if you look at just one sentence. We've already seen that that would contradict Peter's quoting of the Old Testament in Acts chapter 2, but also just three chapters before in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul himself clearly says, when the women pray and prophesy. So if Paul says, if he affirms the women praying and prophesying in public in chapter 11, but then he forbids it in 14, so something's going on. Now, I don't think that Paul just had short-term memory loss. There's got to be something else that there's a, a context that he's assuming that we understand in chapter 14. Now consider what he was writing about. So in chapter 11, he gives a picture. If you remember this, if you don't remember this, I'd encourage you to obviously read the scripture, but then maybe even go back to the sermon that I, I preached on this uh, back in maybe October, November. Chapter 11 gives a picture that the women were usurping the authority of the elders in their church and also disrespecting their husbands. So they would come to the church gathering and they would maybe speak in the church gathering, but they were doing it in a, in a way that was usurping the authority of the elders in the church and publicly just disrespecting their husbands. And so he was addressing that in chapter 11. He also says in chapter 11 to let them pray and prophesy, but allow them to do it in a right orderly fashion, showing respect to the church gathering respect to the elders of the church and respect to their husbands. So he wasn't forbidding them to, to speak or do any or, or pray or prophesy, but he was forbidding them to, to do it improperly in a disrespectful way. And so here in 14, it seems that he's just continuing that thought, kind of alluding back to chapter 11. He continues that thought, but gives the stern reminder, virtually saying, everyone should prophesy and speak in tongues but it needs to be in order and the prophecies need to be weighed. There needs to be some kind of order. But remember, it's almost as if he's saying, remember, as I mentioned a couple chapters ago, the women specifically have been disruptive and they have not been adhering to this, what I just said in chapter 14, to be orderly. So let them keep silent if they're gonna be doing so in a disorderly way. It's shameful for them to speak otherwise. So it'd be kind of like this, understanding the dynamic of him allowing them to speak in 11 and then forbidding to 14, it'd be kind of something like this. If I gave a sermon, and if in the beginning of the sermon, uh, let's say we had, you know, when, uh, this, this morning uh, when Robbie read scripture during uh, the music. I mean, let's say we had one of the kids come up, and the, one of the kids read scripture. A lot, a lot of times they do maybe for one of our Christmas services or something. We have the kids read scripture. Uh, sometimes you'll see some of the kids, we'll see Kylie or my boys playing on the worship team. Uh, we see the kids interact sometimes. And I might, right after that, say, man, it's so awesome to see our kids reading scripture and singing uh, and, and interacting with us on the days that they stay in service with us. I love singing. I just want to encourage that if you're, one of your kids wants to read scripture uh, or, uh, you know, we've had high schoolers uh, lead communion before, it's just an awesome thing that we see the kids do that. But then let's say later on in the sermon, uh, we're talking about some distraction. I say, hey, parents, I just want you to know, if, you're, if your kids start getting loud, uh, next to you. It's going to be a real distraction to the people behind you, so it's better if, they just, if the kids just keep silent in church. I just said two completely different things. I love the kids interacting and speaking in church, but then 20 minutes later I said, your kids need to stay silent in church. Well, which is true. They're both true. They're both totally true, but it's totally just a, a context thing. If they're going to speak out of order, then it's better they just stay quiet. And then when they get home, you guys can talk about stuff or you can whisper or you can go out to the lobby or whatever it is. And so what I think that Paul is doing here very clearly, because he says in 11 that this particular speaking is allowed, but this kind of speaking is not allowed. And if you look at 14, sandwiched in between the verses before and afterwards, then the context of 1 Corinthians, the whole book, especially chapter 11, and then the context of the whole Bible, it doesn't seem at all that Paul is giving a blanket statement to forbid women speaking in a church service. 
To me, it seems abundantly clear that we would see that. Now, I also want to be clear, though, in saying that I'm not saying that this was just a specific problem in the Corinthian church. A lot of people who just want to avoid this text and say, oh, that was just a cultural thing for the Corinthians and we don't have to look at that at all. It's not just for the Corinthians. It's something that every church needs to grapple with to understand what does orderly look like. What is a proper relationship between uh, the, the, the church members and the elders and the husbands and the wives and the parents and the kids? What does a proper order of life look like, not just in the Corinthian church, but in every church? So we can't just kind of brush this thing aside and say, oh, it's just cultural. We don't have to listen to that. No, he says this is for all the churches, and he even points to the Old Testament law. So it wasn't even all the churches in that cultural time frame, like it was just a cultural thing in that, that era but he points even to the law. So there's something deeper in here that is for all the churches even today. So even though there was a specific problem that he was addressing in the Corinthian church, there's also a deeper issue that every church throughout the ages needs to wrestle with. And so Paul has been reminding the church and challenging the church to remember God's orderly nature. He even points to the Old Testament law to say this isn't just cultural. This is coming from even God's law. The bigger issue that he is pointing all of uh, these issues towards, whether it is suing each other, whether it's the pursuit of gifts, or how we allow certain sin in the church, the bigger issue that he's saying he's pointing everyone to God, to God's order, the order that flows from him in his nature Now this order, this how things work together, how elders interact with the members of the church and vice versa and husbands and wives and kids and uh, relationships of people that want to sue each other and they're not getting along and and allowing and, and not cozying up to the rich and the famous in Corinth and all these things. We're seeing kind of a, a, a proclivity for the Corinthians to, to pursue a hierarchy in their culture. Women are trying to usurp the authority of the elders and their husbands, and then you have people that are uh, chumming up with the, the people that have authority in their church, and so we're seeing this kind of uh, desire for a hierarchy, trying to climb this ladder and, and pass other people, but that's not God's order. God's order, this is a big word, but it's an important word. What God's really getting after here is that they would have a, a healthy ontological order, and that's a big word ontological order. That's the order of how we relate, how we're like a a, a jigsaw puzzle. The jigsaw puzzles, this piece isn't more important than that piece. They serve a different uh, place in the puzzle. They interact differently. This piece cannot be that piece. This piece was not designed to be that piece. This piece was designed to go exactly right here. And so there's a, a, a difference in all these jigsaw puzzle pieces, but they fit together in a, in a particularly ontological way. This one cannot be that one, but they have to fit together in a context, a context that works, a context that, uh, that this one is not higher than, but this one actually fits together here. And so as we look at the way that God is actually his own nature, the way that he is actually wired, so to speak, we see that Christian life, church life should flow out of this particular ontological order, not a hierarchical order of this guy is more important than this guy, this guy is more powerful than that guy, this guy is more famous than this guy, and, and not in that kind of a way. That's not what's going on here, but how we relate to one another. So whether it's church life or church services or married life or family life, these things are not meant to be a free-for-all. It's not whatever you think, however you feel, That's not how it's supposed to be because that's not how God is. Paul even says, God is not a God of disorder, but one of order. And so all of our life should reflect the orderly nature of God, the ontological order of God. And this order is rooted completely in his nature. So for us to do a free-for-all in our church life, in our family life, in our married life, and just kind of design and wire our lives how we think is good is to completely turn our back on the very nature of God. It's to bring reproach upon the very nature of God. God has ordained certain practices in order to be followed in church life. And I don't just mean church services, but in the life of the church, of, of Christians. He's designed certain orders that would flow out of his own being, 
not just in our church service, though that's one specific thing he's addressing, but the addressing of the church service in 1 Corinthians 14 flows out of a deeper order that he wants the Corinthians to see, this very important ontological order. God has designed the relationships in our lives to have a certain aspect that is orderly and reflective of Him. Men are to lead their wives by being humble servant leaders. Women follow the godly leading of their husbands, not as a second-class citizen, that would be a hierarchy, but as loving and encouraging partners in their marriage. Churches are to be local congregations that God has planted with godly men serving as dedicated shepherds. We're designed, all of us, to be dedicated and committed to accountability in a local church. And I'm just going to say this. I, this, I know this phrase, this phrase in itself isn't bad. It kind of depends on how you're saying it, but I hear sometimes in certain circles, and usually in the circles of some of my friends, uh, I understand what they're saying, so, so I'm not saying this is a blank bad statement, but I hear a lot of circles say, well, I am the church. And there's this kind of air about it that says, well, no, I don't need to be part of the church because I am the church. You're not the church, church. <laughs> Collectively, if I address all of you, you're the church, you're part of the church, but you as an individual, you are not the entire church. You're not designed to simply be the church. You're the church when you are gathered together with the church. That'd be like a husband saying, I am the marriage. No, you're not. You're not the marriage. Who do you think you are? You think you're a complete marriage? How arrogant are you if you think that you are the marriage? It'd be like a, a mom saying, I am the family. Some of you moms have probably said something like that. <laughs> if mom ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. <laughs> But, but moms, you are not the family. You are, you are part of a family, and together you make a family. But as individuals, if we get that mentality that I am the church, all of a sudden you think, I don't, I don't need all this. No, you've been adopted to become part of the church, and you're designed to have fellowship with the church, and you are a part of the church, absolutely. And I understand the sentiment of that to say like when we go out and we're going to be the church, I totally get that. So I'm not saying it's a bad phrase in itself, but sometimes it comes with that air of, of I'm kind of my own entity, the church. No, you are not. No, you are not. You've been brought into the fellowship of the saints. You are strong, not in your individual personhood, but as you are collected to become one body with the body of Christ. You're not designed to be a finger or a hand that is cut off from the body. You've been designed to be part of the singular body of Christ. So husbands, you are not the marriage. You don't stick out your chest and say, look, I'm the man of the house. That's not how we lead. You lead, but not like that. Paul says clearly throughout his letters that, that pastors shouldn't be like that with their flock either. We have to be humble in serving each other. Yes, there's an ontological order of how we interact and the, the place that men play in the, in the uh, marriage and the women and the kids and the, the parents and the elders and, and the members. Those are all important things, but it's not this, I'm better than you, I'm higher than you, or I am the church, I am the, the family, I am the marriage. No, there, there's an ontological importance to how we all fit together. But some oppose this. We bristle at this. We love our, our independence. We love our autonomy. We love to just kind of be an entity unto ourselves. We love our self-strength. We love our self-reliance. We love our enlightened thinking or our wokeness of how we just see things so differently. And we hate the S word, submission, or the S word, servanthood. We hate those words. They're like bad words in our culture, and our language. All of us in some area of our life has an inner child that screams out, you're not the boss of me. All of us have that somewhere in our life. You've been challenged and you've had to kind of eat your own words. You've had to just endure something at the behest of someone else. And inside you're going, you're not the boss of me. Or maybe you read some of Paul's words or some of Christ's words. You go, well, if you read Christ's words, you better not say you're not the boss of me. But, 
But you read, sometimes, you, sometimes we do that. We feel that. We know that we should, but inside we're going, well, what, is, what does Paul know about this? This is a different age. This is a different culture. But it happens. Wives to husbands. You're not the boss of me. Husbands to wives. You're not the boss of me. Church members to pastors. Friends to other friends who are keeping them accountable in their sin. It's none of your business. That's between me and the Lord. I and mean, that's like the spiritual mic drop right there. You don't know what goes on in my life. And this isn't just in our day, but this is in the age of the Corinthians. They just wanted to do what they felt was right for an orderly life, an orderly church life. No accountability, no following God's order of design or creation, living life in a disorderly way, shunning the order of God, usurping the authorities and relationships and the ontological order that God has put in our lives. Paul sees this as clearly presumptuous and arrogant looking back again at verse 36 here so was it from you that the word of God came oh you're gonna oh you're gonna do marriage different oh because you're 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 you have this spiritual enlightenment I see so God's word came to you specifically and it disagrees with with what I say as an apostle and what's written in the law are you the only ones that God's word has reached I mean he's saying to the wives, the husbands. Wives, you you think that what I'm saying is old-fashioned? Husbands, you just think you can demand whatever you want because I'm the man of the house? So you've got a different way of doing things than what is in God's word? You've got a word from the Lord that you insist that we should all hear it? You're gonna interrupt us and you're gonna insist that, nope, God spoke and this is how we're gonna do things from now on. This is how I'm gonna live my life. Well, he says, if anyone thinks he's a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I'm writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone doesn't recognize this, he's not recognized. So my brothers, earnestly desire to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. So as a reminder, he says to them, you can come with your revelation and prophecies and new ways of doing things in your own order, as if you're your own authority, that God gave you special permission to live differently. But I want to tell you, if you think you have that authority, you need to acknowledge that I've I'm, I'm been called as an apostle. And I've brought God's word, commissioned by Jesus Christ himself. In other words, if you think that you've got some idea of how things should be done, because our culture has changed or whatever, or you're going to live your life how you think it should be, it better line up with what Paul has commanded, what Scripture commands. But I understand, I know, that it's hard for us sometimes to see the value of God's decrees. A mom or a dad sometimes might say to a a young child, you can't touch that hot stove. But the kid doesn't really understand. A parent knows that these laws and decrees are not to imprison the kids, and that's sometimes how we feel. These certain things are going to oppress us or, or they're going to limit us. But these things aren't to imprison us. They're, they're to free us. A mom or dad doesn't forbid their kids to do something to limit them, but it's to, to keep them safe, to, to free them. But a child doesn't understand that. A child doesn't understand what the, the purpose of some of these things are. Our God gives us this order, but he doesn't just make it arbitrary. He is this order. He shows us this order. He models this order. He exists in this order. And our lives should flow from this order. Ladies, submission is not a bad word. Men, servanthood is not a bad word. P.T. Forsyth, he said this, he said, submission is not inferiority. It is godlike. It is godlike. So to close, I just want to give you a few ways that the Trinity, the triune God, is reflected in our relationships. You can follow along with me in your notes here. The Trinity gives us this model. This flows from God himself. The Son, Son of God, submits to the the Father's plan. He submits to his Father, even though the Son is not less than the Father in a hierarchy way. They are equal, equal God, but yet the Son submits to His Father. 
The Spirit is sent out by the Father and the Son to do their will, even though he is not less than them. So to submit is godlike. The Spirit submits to the Father and the Son. The Son submits to the Father, even though they are not less than each other. It doesn't lower them or oppress them. They honor each other. The Trinity is reflected in the gospel itself. The Son lays down His life for His bride, us, the church, even though He is not less than her in the sense that the bride has now been made one with Him and we've been called to be sons and daughters alongside of Him. I'm not saying that we're as great as God, but in the sense of our adoption into the kingdom, She, the church, submits to him because she loves him and trusts him, even though she is not less than him. Again, the same little caveat there. We know we're less than God, but in the sense of our adoption being made one with Christ himself, we're going to rule and reign at his right hand with him. We're brought into the kingdom. Jesus himself said that the Father loves us with the same love that he loves Jesus with. And yet he submits himself to us and, and, and we submit to him. The Trinity is reflected in the church. In the church, the elders, the shepherds lay down their lives for the sheep, serving them and washing their feet just as the good shepherd modeled. Not because the pastor is less than the church members, but because he loves them. The members of the church submit to the Christ-focused leading of the shepherds, not because they're less than him and not because he's better than they but because they trust not only those elder shepherds, but they trust the God who put those shepherds in that church. Not only that, but we're all to esteem each other as greater than ourselves. As Ephesians 4 says, and Ephesians 4 talks about uh, the women submitting to their husbands and, and the husbands laying down their lives for their wives, but in that same exact chapter, he says that we should all submit one to another. So again, it's not just women to the husbands, but he says all of us should submit one to another. Next, the Trinity is reflected in marriage. Husbands, like Christ, lay down their lives for their bride. Not because he's less than her, but because he loves her and wants to love her as Christ loved the church. And she also submits to her husband, not because she's less than him, but because she trusts him and trusts the God who sovereignly put him in her life. When I've done weddings in the past, I'll oftentimes read through this portion of Ephesians 4, and it starts, Paul starts with uh, the wife submitting to the husband. And I'll kind of make a little offhanded joke to say to husbands, I know this sounds like a really great deal. I've got this wife who's going to submit to me. But then you go into the very next sentence and it says, husbands, you're to lay down your life for your wife. That's a different type of submission altogether. He, this man has to lay down his own life. And so in this particular sense, they're both to submit to one to another just in a different particular way. But in some ways, it seems to me that the husband actually is supposed to even go above and beyond just submission, but to lay his life down. Because you ask yourself, how did Christ lay his life down for his bride? He died for her. He died for her. That is a servant leadership and a type of humility that the husbands ought to live out. So again, this isn't about a hierarchy, putting the men above the women, the women down here, all that kind of stuff. They're different. They're just different. The different roles, but yet equal. The Trinity is reflected in family. Parents lay down their lives for their kids. They wash their feet, they serve them, they care for them and provide for them, not because the children are better than the parents, but because the children are loved by the parents. And children are to obey and submit to their parents, not because they're less than their parents, not because they're inferior, they're not, they're equal to their parents in their personhood. In their imaging of God, they're completely equal. But they submit and obey because they trust their parents and trust the God who gave the parents to them. There's an order in the home. The kids don't run the house. Not because they're unequal, because they're different in their role. Their ontological order in the family is different. They're not unequal. It's just a different place that they have. Husbands and wives, one is not better than or higher than the other. They have different roles. 
elders, members. It's not that one is better than the other, one is lower than the other. They're equal. There's just different roles. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They're equal, yet they have different roles. They submit in different ways. They lead in different ways. They, they serve in different ways. It's a beautiful thing, church, to see a family, a marriage, a church reflect the Trinity. To see a family look like God. To see a marriage look like God. To see a church look like God is a beautiful thing that mesmerizes even non-believers around who, who actually see men and women in this particular way where they have this mutual respect for each other. Or to watch families who get along and respect one another. To see a church that actually isn't cantankerous and arguing and bickering all the time. When non-believers see a church love each other and submit one another and esteem each other as higher than the other person, that's mesmerizing to people who don't have those kinds of friendships. And so if we can humble ourselves and learn to submit one to another, to be servant leaders one to another in a way that reflects the Trinity, we will see God glorified in our lives because all of this points to God being glorified. That is Paul's biggest pain that he sees as he observes the Corinthian church. It's more than just orderly church service. That's just a symptom of a deeper problem in the Corinthian church. He's just pointing all these things out, suing each other and disorderly worship. It comes from a deeper place. It's that they don't respect the character and nature of God himself. And that's what pains him. He wants the Corinthian church to be a Christ-centered church so they can have freedom, true freedom. He's not doing these things to oppress them, to shackle them. No, so that they can have true freedom, freedom from doing the, the things that they seem, that seem right to us, but in the end, the way is death, church. We can do things, that's what Proverbs says, there's a way that seems right to us. We think we're so wise, but in the end, the way is death. He wants to free us from the pressure of our own arrogance and self-centered living. The pressure to be uh, ingenious and come up with a way of doing life. He wants us to have the freedom from uh, living out a Christian faith that actually doesn't follow Christ. He doesn't want us to have that kind of life that just is slavery. A Christian life that doesn't actually follow Christ the guilt, the shame that we have on the inside when that's the life we live uh, is awful. You feel like you're a hypocrite walking around. He wants to free you from that. He'd rather see us trusting God and trusting his ways, trusting his nature. So church, I'd like us just to pray this morning for wisdom and humility, praying that we would trust God's word, trust his ways, trust his wisdom. And trust his order that he gives us to live out the lives that he has designed for us to live out that flows from his very nature. Father in heaven, you are a just an unfathomable deeply uh, rich and unexhaustive God. We cannot get to the bottom of who you are. Your nature, your character, your ways, your wisdom. It is unsearchable in a complete and total way. Though you invite us to search you. Though you invite us to know you. And you invite us to reflect you. But we struggle. We wrestle. We bristle. Whether it's circumstances in our lives that we just hate. We cry out to you, why God, why are you letting this happen to me? Or if it's certain things that are more doctrinal, theological, like this morning. We bristle. And we fight. But God, even as you told your servant, Paul, we shouldn't kick against you like a horse kicks against its rider and the rider just digs his spurs in more and more until that horse finally submits. We know that the more, if, if we've been born again, if we're a son or daughter of the living God and we kick against you and we fight against you, uh, we know that we're going to lose this arm wrestling match. And so help us to have the humility to know that your thoughts are above our thoughts, your ways are above our ways. 
Your mind is above our mind. And we want to understand. We don't want to just simply blindly follow, though we, we should be able to because we don't walk by faith. We walk by, or not by sight, but by faith. And so hopefully we can follow you as we seek to understand. But we do. We want to understand. We want to know these things. And your servant Paul even said in 14 that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of these things. So, so we know that it's your desire for us to understand your ways, why they're in your word, why they exist. And yet in the meantime, God, we ask for meekness and humility that we would follow you and trust you even when we don't understand. But we would just know that your words are true and your words are good. Help us, O Lord. Keep us humble. Keep us close. We want to reflect you in our lives. Every aspect of life, we want to reflect you. And God, we just ask all these things, Lord, by the power of your Spirit, because we know that in ourselves we cannot do this. So by the power of your Spirit, through the working of your Word in our hearts, and through the name of Jesus, we ask all these things. Amen.